I feel a bit strange being a Midwestern farm boy presenting uh, an English inventor in a French calotype conference here, so we'll do a little crossing of cultures. It's uh, one of many ironies that the very best uh, photographic portrait that we have of Talbot is in fact a daguerreotype, uh, and so we will start our cross-cultural uh, trip that way. This audience well knows the achievements of Daguerre, uh, and I just wanted to quickly review this just to contrast the two threads of photography that came together in 1839. Daguerre, of course, was a very accomplished artist, and also, of course, the inventor and promoter of the diorama, uh, an early movie theater, if you will, but a way of providing illusions, visual illusions, uh, to a mass public. And when photography was first announced in 1839, of course, uh, here in Paris, uh, it was announced at the Academy in a very formal context, uh, immediately got the backing of the French government, and uh, particularly of Francois Arago, who uh, promoted it. Arago had been a friend of Talbot's, um, but had not disclosed anything about Daguerre, of course, before that. And I love daguerreotypes. They are absolutely magical. Uh, as all of you know, they're best if you go in a darkened room with a candle and a glass of red wine. <laughs> Maybe two glasses of red wine with a proper person, but they're a very intimate experience. And as John Ruskin found here in the Stones of Venice, uh, of course, they provided an enormously detailed image uh, that was just absolutely magical. Had Talbot been the first one to announce photography in 1839, I think things would have gotten off to a very slow start. And it was this magical character, the daguerreotype, that grabbed the public imagination. But in the long run, it had its limitations. Uh, this was a very patient man, I don't remember anymore, in a science museum basement about maybe 40 years ago, civil servant holding up this big daguerreotype. Obviously, it had problems of limitation of scale, uh, the expensive base and inflexible base of silver-plated copper, and the fact that you couldn't use it in any sort of illustration. Uh, you can imagine publishers are, I've just lost my screen here, uh, publishers are uh, nervous enough about photographs. You can imagine saying, I want to bind in 40 original daguerreotypes uh, into each copy of my book. This, uh, thanks to Paul Messier for this slide, recently discovered daguerre triptych, uh, discovered in Russia, and survived all the years. Uh, curiously, adds very substantially to our stock of daguerre images. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe there are only about, there are fewer than two dozen known daguerre, daguerreotypes in the world. Uh, there's a handful of letters, uh, a few documents, no research notebooks, we know an enormous amount about the daguerreotype, and of course there are hundreds of thousands of daguerreotypes surviving, but we know virtually nothing about daguerre and the daguerreotype. And that's in spite of a lot of recent research on it. On the other hand, we know quite a bit about William Henry Fox Talbot. I don't think any of you will have seen one of these before, and I'm sure none of you have conserved one of these. This is an iotype. And this is one of Talbot's experiments on the daguerreotype. Uh, this was made by Grant Romer quite recently. We don't know of any Talbot's ones who have survived, but his notes are so complete that Grant was able to reproduce the process. And this is actually a, a blend between Talbot's process and uh, the daguerreotype itself. Talbot bought three daguerreotype cameras immediately, uh, had them, his uncle brought them in in the diplomatic bag and uh, he began experimenting with the process right away. He was a brilliant young man. Uh, this is a picture, he's born in 1800, this is a picture done in 1807, probably by done one of his Welsh cousins. I've always loved this solar flare of ideas coming out of his mind. He, uh, when you read his young diaries, he's just uh, slightly between precocious and obnoxious, but obviously brilliant, and his mother knew that he was brilliant. Uh, and I think I would have liked him very much as a young man. Uh, of course, ink doesn't usually run upwards. 
I imagine the simple explanation here is that this was probably drawn using a lens which would have inverted the image and his cousin got a little bit too enthusiastic with the ink and it ran down. So uh, he certainly had exposure to optical devices and scientific devices uh, all through his life. Um, Michel Friseau yesterday very kindly went over a lot of uh, Talbot's uh, uh, scientific accomplishments, uh, saving me some time here. Uh, before photography, uh, he had become a member of parliament. Uh, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, a fellow of the Astronomical Society, a noted botanist, uh, good friends with a number of major scientists, uh, both in the continent and in Britain. Uh, had published many scientific papers, had started on the first of his three books, uh, had gotten two gold medals from the Royal Society, uh, an enormously accomplished but enormously personal person. He got married and became a member of Parliament just about the same time, uh, got married at the end of 1832, became a member of the first Reform Parliament in 1833, and Several months later, when Parliament finally went into recess, he took his new wife, Constance, on her first continental tour. Uh, Henry had traveled to the continent a great deal uh, in his youth, uh, but his wife had never been there. And they found themselves at Villa Melzi, um, on uh, near Bellagio on Lake Como. Uh, George Clooney wasn't there yet, <laughs> but it was a very common resource even at the time. Uh, his sister and several other family members joined them uh, in the autumn of 1833, and all of them were happily sketching away. And Henry Talbot, amongst these, amongst all of his accomplishments, he absolutely could not draw. And in the days before photography, not being able to communicate something visually uh, was, of course, an enormous drawback. So he turned to science and turned to the camera lucida as a drawing instrument. How many of you have tried to drive with a camera lucida? How many of you have succeeded? Yeah, and I'd have to put my hand down at that point. This is my wife's camera lucida set up uh, at Villa Meltzi. She's, uh, she's not the Henry Talbot of the family, I am. Uh, she's the Sir John Herschel, uh, Talbot's friend who was very accomplished with the camera lucida. Uh, but he set up here hoping that he could use science, use technology to help him draw. And what you're about to see, uh, I've seen a lot of Talbots over the past half century. This is the very, very finest drawing that Talbot ever accomplished. And you can see why he needed to invent photography. <laughs> he began to think, the camera lucid, of course, does not project an image, but he began to think about exactly what his problem was. And he had no way of translating that very complex, three-dimensional, colorful world of line and form and tone onto a flat sheet of paper. But he thought about the camera obscura, which did project an actual image, and realized, just like we saw sunburns in that yesterday, realized that light did have an effect on physical objects, and from that began to formulate the idea of how he could use nature to draw herself. He returned to England to Laycock Abbey at the end of 1833, was immediately caught up in parliamentary duties uh, in the spring of 1834. It was a very tumultuous time. And we don't know exactly when, but sometime in the spring of 1834 at Laycock Abbey, he began to put into practice what he had conceived of in Italy and uh, wanted to find a way to, to make it real. Uh, this sadly has been taken down years ago, but this was a reconstruction at the Smithsonian Museum. Um, I'm still looking for this wax figure of Talbot. They don't know what they did with it. But the furniture actually came from Laycock Abbey. It was purchased back in the 1960s. And this was the bottle room at Laycock Abbey. It was the place where he did uh, his research and his experiments. It's right above the kitchen. And of course, um, a country house like that was really a self-contained place. It had its own manufacturing. It had its own wells. It had uh, materials from the kitchen. It had pots and pans, everything that one would need for a research laboratory. So this invention of photography took place in the context of this rather domestic situation. He discovered in his library very quickly, if he didn't know it already, that the salts of silver were considered peculiarly sensitive to light. This, of course, was known for centuries. Uh, 
and uh, began to experiment with the salts of silver. Uh, he found, uh, as had Wedgwood and probably many people that we'll never hear of before him, that it was relatively easy to form an image on a piece of paper. You coat it with a light sensitive silver compound. Uh, he found, of course, in a camera initially, there wasn't enough light and did the obvious thing of making a photogram, taking it outdoors under a plant and reduced the silver and got an image like this. And there were probably hundreds and hundreds of people that are lost to history who had done exactly the same thing. But like Wedgwood, he found the same problem that there was no way to arrest the light sensitivity of that. And so literally, as you were looking at your newly created beautiful piece of art, it began to destroy itself. Because the very thing you needed to look at it with light was also, of course, the thing that it reacted to. Fortunately, he used, some of you may remember this gentleman, just think fig leaves. Um, Fortunately, he found that silver nitrate was uh, not very sensitive to light in spite of what had been published, that silver chloride was very sensitive to light. Unfortunately, silver nitrate is easy to dissolve in water and it's easy to coat on a piece of paper. Silver chloride is a bit like the snow in the snow globe here. It's a, uh, somewhere between a flocculent and a uh, runny mass and it's something that you can't coat on. So he went to a two-step process and coated ordinary writing paper, Wattman paper, as we've seen plenty of already in this conference, coated it with table salt from the kitchen, and then painted it over with silver nitrate. And when he did that, there was a chemical reaction. The silver chloride precipitated like this, but was immediately trapped in the fibers of the paper. He didn't have to coat it on. It was actually formed within the structure of the paper itself. And it's because of that two-step process, I think, that he made the breakthrough of what he called a fixer. Uh, we call it stabilization today. But he discovered, of course, that there was an accidental difference in the ratio between salt and silver on these very hastily coated sheets of paper. He noticed that things were happening differently on the periphery. And counterintuitively, he figured out that if he had a very a weak solution of table salt, that that made a very sensitive silver chloride. And then after exposure, if he came back with a very strong solution of table salt, just like you would preserve fish in the kitchen, if he came back with a very strong solution of table salt, it would render that silver chloride relatively insensitive to light. He thought of the fixer in the same sense of like a fixative for a chalk drawing, you know, something that would stabilize it not really change the nature of it. And once he had that, by 1834, um, I'm cheating a little bit, this in here is actually 1836, but by 1834, uh, he was able to make these relatively permanent uh, images using light sensitive silver chloride, and then as we put it now, stabilizing it um, with various compounds, um, uh, iodine and bromine and uh, chlorine. Uh, all of the halides are, are capable of doing this and he experimented with several. That's the way this still looks. And from 1834, I have to keep shifting this, I used to say 150 years and now we're approaching two centuries, this image is still visible. So I'm willing to accept that as being fairly permanent, fairly successful. And of course the very famous lattice window, which is one that uh, he displayed in 1839, uh, but recorded at a time in August of 1835. He was finally able to use a small camera obscura, uh, about the size of an apple, little tiny wooden box cobbled together. Uh, his wife once called them mouse traps, and that, that term has stuck uh, for them. But these little tiny cameras, he was able to accumulate enough light. Initially, from within Laycock Abbey, he's literally looking at light here. He's looking at a window from the inside. But in that summer of 1835, uh, this one in George Eastman Museum, as they now style themselves. When I worked there, it was George Eastman House. But this lovely little scrap of a negative, not much bigger than a good-sized postage stamp. You can see where it was pasted into this little wooden box for exposure and then hastily ripped out. And there is the tower at Laycock Abbey, of course, in a negative form. 
this didn't bother Talbot at all. Um, he knew uh, how nature worked, and he was asking nature to do the drawing, and nature, of course, used light to darken things. And so he was quite happy to see this as a negative. Um, that was nature's way of drawing. You probably know the, the story of Samuel Morris, uh, one of the inventors of the telegraph, American, uh, who visited Daguerre and went back very excitedly with news of the daguerreotype in America. Uh, he claimed right after his student days in Yale, uh, he was a portrait painter in the late 1820s, that he tried to invent photography. But he found that light produced dark. In other words, it made a negative. And as an artist, he couldn't accept that. That was not the way he wanted to do his portraits. Talbot was most definitely not an artist, therefore had no preconceptions, therefore the negative was an absolutely natural expression of nature. He understood right away that he could reverse this, that he could make things into the way that his eye would see them. Uh, he talked about simply taking another sheet of sensitive paper under that original first sheet and he would make a negative of a negative, which of course would be a positive print. So by 1834, he understood the idea of making a print, just didn't see any reason to. That's not the way that nature drew. But also very interestingly, I hope I don't blow something up here. Um, the name for his first process that came down to 1839 was photogenic drawing. But notice originally, that he called it the skiographic process. And of course, that was a common theatrical process of projecting things and defining them through their shadows. And the shadow is Talbot's friend throughout photography. Uh, it's certainly what he knew to do. So he could make prints right away. He just saw no reason to. We come to January 1839, the daguerreotype is announced and immediately celebrated, very justifiably so. Uh, tremendous publicity campaign on the part of the French government, and again, particularly Francois Artigo. Um, but this became a matter of huge public uh, interest. Word reached Talbot sometime in the middle of January about a Frenchman who had found a way to capture the images in the camera obscura. Uh, no details. But he then took his own materials, which were left over from 1835. Uh, January 1839 happened to be one of the worst uh, periods on record for British uh, weather. And if you've ever spent any time in Britain, uh, that is quite a record. It was absolutely dark every day. There was no way he could make fresh things. But on the 25th of January 1839, he went to his friend Michael Faraday at the Royal Institution in London and brought along these pictures that had been sitting in a desk drawer since 1835, and had his first public display of photography in the library of the Royal Institution. And Faraday said, now that nature is doing her own drawing, we have no idea where this art is going to lead. In 1839, with that very little light, there was very little that uh, Talbot could do. Um, a lovely little piece of lace, which I think was one of the items exhibited in January of 1839, again, probably left over from several years before. Um, but this was the kind of thing that he was able to produce, uh, if anything at all. And of course, the daguerreotypes uh, that Daguerre were producing were, were much, much more impressive uh, at the time, although I love this little piece of dancing lace here. Uh, I don't know why he trimmed the paper this way, but. Uh, maybe to get rid of chemical defects. As far as we know, the first camera negative that he ever printed was in April of 1839. His mother, Lady Elizabeth Fielding, finally got after him and uh, paraphrasing here, but uh, he said, she said, first of all, you're giving away your seed corn. You have only so many photographs and you're giving them away to people. You will have nothing left. And she said, besides, People don't understand what these negatives are anyway. You have to make prints. So he started making prints uh, partially to multiply his efforts and partially to make them more understandable to other people, even though he was quite comfortable with the negative himself. This is one uh, where I can trace the provenance very exactly. Uh, 
Lady Fielding uh, wrote a very complaining letter to Henry, uh, which is not unusual. If you've looked at the 10,000 letters online, you'll realize that she's quite critical of him often. Um, but she wrote to him and said that this morning before I was up, I got knocked up in the phrasing of the period. I got knocked up by Dr. Himmel. He called at Laycock Abbey, and he's here on behalf of the uh, Russian uh, czar, and wanted some samples, and he took away all my good ones. Uh, I know the steamship that he went on. He went to St. Petersburg. These were presented. Uh, Himmel died early. His collection eventually went into the Academy of Sciences. And in 1994, I finally saw this print that had been preserved marvelously since it left Laycock Abbey uh, in, Mar in April of 1839. So uh, this is the first fully documented print made from a negative uh, within Talbot's work. By the end of 1839, he was getting fairly melancholy. Uh, Daguerre had gotten, of course, a big pension from the French government. He had gotten uh, a lot of public recognition and was uh, justly celebrated. Talbot had, through a number of problems with the Royal Society, had not been able to uh, get any recognition at all and really retreated into his own study. But over the course of the end of 1839 into 1840, he began keeping re listings of his negatives and his accomplishments, thinking through then. And we get to the spring of 1840, and he starts producing really beautiful photogenic drawing negatives. It's important to realize these are printout negatives. There's no development. These are pre calotype and they're gorgeous. This one's in the Getty. Uh, it's a garden wall, and I think you can see both the artistic arrangement, of course, and the technical accomplishment of it, uh, a whole plate size. His sister's window. This is a chap who, just a few years before, couldn't make a rudimentary drawing, and now he's able to render pearls in sunlight, in objects, in the trunk of a larch. In 1840, he continued his experiments. His spirits were buoyed. And at some point, uh, very similar to the apocryphal story about Daguerre breaking a thermometer, at some point, supposedly Talbot went off for tea, came back, and was surprised to find that uh, he had an image on a previously blank sheet of paper. And he very quickly figured out that he'd introduced a new chemical, and there was a latent image. There was an image that had been triggered that he couldn't see that was then developed by that chemical. And he knew this was so important, he actually cut the words out of his notebook uh, so that nobody would discover this before he had a chance to publish it. Uh, that, of course, was gallic acid. And by November of 1840, using what will be called the calotype process, this developed negative that greatly reduced exposure times, he's able to take this picture in the great hall of Laycock Abbey. Uh, Diogenes, of course, searching for truth with his lantern. Uh, this is a display of light that comes from the windows. Uh, when the Talbot family was still there, uh, after tourists would leave at the end of the day, the drinks cupboard was right next to this. They'd open up this big oak cupboard and we'd all sit on the table there having our gin and tonics. And this incredible composition exists for less than a minute because the sunlight is beginning to paint across the room. Uh, as the Republicans would have it, of course, the sun's revolving around the earth and the shadows are moving. But whichever way you take it, uh, this is a very transitory image. This is 10 years, less than 10 years from when he can't make a drawing. And if photography had stopped at this point, um, I think it would have been a great ending. And snapshots. I don't know how many selfies were taken in the room this morning before the talk, quite a few. But back in Talbot's day, this was so incredible to be able to take a picture of your loved ones in 30 seconds. This was the stew pond at Lake Ock Abbey. The nuns used to raise the fish. It's in fact a little tiny pond. It's uh, not as big as this room. But he put his camera down on the bank and created this marvelous composition. June of 1841 goes into London. Um, for those of you following the blog uh, that we have at the Catalogue Raisonnée, I had a guest blogger last week. And in fact, uh, this is a very important recording 
of one of uh, Brunel's first works, the Hungerford Bridge, under construction. But here we have that magical moment in time when the Houses of Parliament have just burnt and before the new ones are built, before Big Ben was put up. And so we see Westminster Abbey up here in a way that had not been seen since the 16th century and hasn't been seen since. He's recorded a slice of time. The building in the Nelson Monument, which uh, I've always particularly enjoyed because here it says no bills to be posted, but we can actually, of course, date this very precisely by the railroad timetables and the plays in that that are there. I can date it down to within one week of when this was taken. He moves on to France, and I'm sorry we have very little time here. He moves on to France, to Rouen. This is in 1843 in the summer. And then uh, Paul-Louis Robert and I, uh, just this uh, year, were able to go out to the storage for Arts and Metier and discovered these incredible negatives that I didn't realize had survived that are dated in Talbot's hand. This is him here in Paris on the 1st of June, 1843. We don't know who he gave this negative to. He had patented the calotype, or Talbotype, as some of his friends would like to have styled it. He didn't like that term personally. And came uh, to Paris to meet up with the Marquis de Bassano uh, in order to market the calotype in France. Uh, this is an area that needs a great deal more study. Um, uh, the Marquis de Bassano was a total crook. Uh, there's a lot of information about him in the correspondence. Uh, if anybody wants to work on him uh, and on the Society Calotype, I would be delighted to try to help them. There's a great deal of needs to be learned yet. There's a few existing pictures that were presented formally. Uh, it's unclear whether Talbot himself actually met with the Marquis. A lot of this was done through his friend, Emelina Pettit. Uh, but we do know that a number of these exist in various states. And then this is one, sadly, I took uh, with a snapshot camera with film on a bed in Laycock Abbey guest room uh, many years ago, so it's not very clear. But you can see here the 5th of July, 1843, uh, that this was dated. Talbot was back in England then. So this is something that was done probably with Nicholas Henneman uh, tutoring the Marquis. Henneman had been Talbot's servant. Uh, went on to form uh, his own photographic establishment in the town of Reading, specifically for the production of editions of photographs. And, of course, the pencil of nature, I'm rushing through this, I'm afraid, but the pencil of nature uh, was this enormous effort on Talbot's part to bring photography before the public. He had come to believe so much in silver prints as a means of displacing lithography, and he'd been interested in books since before the introduction of photography, that he started issuing the Pencil of Nature, but found that he had to explain, even in 1844, the public didn't understand what photographs were. That's a little hard for us to I understand now, but he had to insert this notice starting in the second issue, and then it got a little bit longer, that these were actually really photographs. The second plate in the Pencil of Nature uh, part of a long series of boulevards of Paris that he did. There are uh, almost 200 negatives of Paris. Uh, and he talks in here about the various elements of the picture. Uh, the fact, uh, well, perhaps starting in the upper right, the fact that there's one shutter open, accidentally catching the sunlight. And, you know, as an artist, he wouldn't have noticed that. The fact that the pavement, or no pavement, the dirt, the watering van has just come through in order to hold down the dust, and it had to swerve to avoid these carts. So we have this little bit of mud uh, surrounded by dust uh, recorded by the camera. And then, of course, at the top, where he said very famously that the camera didn't care, it would record the chimney pots uh, just as happily as the Apollo of Belvedere, that it saw everything that was in front of it. A portion of one of the calotype negatives, uh, still in excellent condition, uh, taken in April of 1844 from the haystack, where, of course, he talked about the detail that was in here. It was Rembrandtish. It was unlike the artificial detail, as he felt, of the daguerreotype, but more like the uh, uh, Rembrandt. And, of course, a number of straws here beyond what any person could put in. This was all very hopeful. 
And they began promoting, again, he didn't like the term Talbot type, but his marketing people did. But then reality hit. And these pictures started going out into the real world. And they were viewed by sunlight. They were viewed in front of smoky coal fires. They were handled. People didn't know how to handle them at all. And of course, this began to bring out some of the flaws in the process. On the left, we have an open door and one that was never trimmed. You can see how it was hand-coated, probably put into a portfolio, probably not seen for 150 years or so, and still survives very, very well. Another one on the bottom right that was actually in a published pencil of nature that probably got viewed in sunlight and got viewed in front of a coal fire and, of course, has degraded enormously. These two would have started out life together the same, and then life gave them a different path. And Talbot sadly came to understand that uh, he was not going to be able to control what happened here. When he was working at Laycock Abbey, the south front of Laycock, and we can see the tower that we saw in that early picture, when he was working at Laycock Abbey, um, he could wait for a sunny day, and he could put out three print frames and do whatever he wanted to because he had total control over the process. He had no demands on production. But when Nicholas Henneman had to start making the prints for the pencil of nature, he had to produce prints under realistic situations. If it was a cloudy day, he had to make use of it. If the water was polluted, which it was in Reading, he had to make use of it. If it was winter and he didn't have money for fire to heat the water, he had to wash the prints in cold water. He had just a boy to do much of this work. And so the production realities, when we tried to scale this up to an industrial scale, the process fell apart. Talbot himself, by 1845, gave up photography, gave up being a photographer. This is one of the very last pictures he took, a lovely calotype negative of, uh, of his friend Calvert Jones in the cloisters of Laycock Abbey, and of course making a beautiful print. Very quickly, uh, so I don't overrun my time too much here. Right away in 1839, uh, we had the understanding that uh, getting photographs into books, into print, was an important thing. Daguerreotypes were engraved directly, destroying the original daguerreotype, making them a printing plate, because you know, logically they started as almost like a printing plate on a piece of metal. But uh, that had its limitations, because it was a drawing in the end. Similarly, uh, in this case, a woodblock was sensitized with silver nitrate and then hand carved with the image formed on it, again, destroying it. Talbot began in, uh, by the end of the 1840s working on what we would eventually know as photogravure of translating photographs into printer's ink because he knew that printer's ink and paper were stable. And one of the problems, uh, and I'm afraid this would have to be another whole lecture, but one of the problems, of course, was tonality. If you see here on the left, you can see how you lose middle tones. Uh, those of you who've done photogravures will understand that. And on the right, you'll see a superimposed pattern of fabric. Talbot began to realize if he began to break up the tones, that he could reproduce them. And eventually, he would use resin. He's known as the inventor of the half-tone dot, uh, for those of you who that have meaning. And by the early 1850s, began to achieve good results of starting out with a photograph, of taking the virtue of having nature make her own drawing, but then uh, translating that into printer's ink. Very quickly, the reason I'm interested in Talbot rather than Daguerre is that there is so much research material available. Um, I think as a uh, failed engineer in one of my past careers, I really feel more kinship with the daguerreotype than I do with photogenic drawing. Uh, but there's just so much available on Talbot. And of all the conservators in the room, I see you as our future historians here. Uh, there are 10,000 letters online. I'm always looking for more. That number slowly creeps up. We have that as a reference. Um, especially for conservators here, this is Harold White uh, around 1950, beginning to sort the letters in Laycock Abbey course, with the requisite cigarette there to show that he's serious, and this teetering stack of letters. Lady Fielding, uh, his mother, was perhaps the first photo historian. 
and it's through her diaries and letters that we know a lot. Uh, this is a portrait he did of her out on the lawn of Lake Hawk Abbey in 1842. Um, couldn't help but being reminded of Canova's uh, uh, Paulina Bor Borghese, which she probably had seen a print of, if not the original. But in her diaries, we can find records of a lot of the photographs and her interactions. There are hundreds and hundreds of Talbot's negatives that have chemical annotations, a lot of which have not been interpreted. The shepherd's crook is coming out. Uh, we have various stages of negatives that have been trimmed down but printed earlier, and this is what the catalog raisonne has put together. Um, there's a museum on a hill in Los Angeles right now being threatened by fire. I won't mention the name, but its curator was convinced that they had the uh, first version of this negative, obviously the same plant specimen, but you can see here where there's a leaf that's dropped off. This one's in Los Angeles. This one's in Oxford. Oxford wins. <laughs> and just finishing up here, Matilda Talbot, who was uh, his granddaughter, uh, who actually sat on his knee. She met him when she was young and inherited Laycock Abbey and became uh, the person who distributed uh, Talbot's material the most. This is an exhibition that she had in 1934 totally filled Lake Hawk Abbey. Again, I put this in for the discomfort of curators, uh, but I've actually found some of these prints yet, identifying them by their pinholes. A little sad, but uh, a lot of these have survived amazingly well. Like I said, Talbot had given up photography by 1845, uh, but had produced an enormous body of work by that point. Right now, we have about 25,000 negatives and prints in the catalog raisonne. But it's from, and just quickly linking to this conference, it's from here that the French took over. And from the late 1840s uh, into the 1850s, of course, we have this enormous explosion of, of absolutely gorgeous uh, French photographs, all based one way or another on what Talbot had achieved. And just finishing with a thought from Talbot himself, he thought that nothing could compare with the beauty of the first idea. Thank you.